Hello, my name is Bob Reich, and I teach here at the Kennedy School. Delighted to have you with us tonight. Years ago, when I first began worrying about the long-term future of the United States economy, I was six foot five. It's uh, taken a lot out of me, wore me down. I have a few years left before I vanish completely. I wanted to share with you some of my thoughts and also uh, share them with our, with our panelists tonight. We're gonna be talking about the American economy. Also, we're going to be talking about the relationship between the private sector and the public sector and trying to define what the national interest is tonight. That becomes a very complicated issue in a global economy, uh, such as we are becoming, because almost every factor of production is becoming global, is moving across borders almost at the speed of an electronic impulse. Technology today, well, there really is no such thing as American technology if you, if you simply take a look down at the street at engineers and scientists at a place like MIT working in laboratories in, with uh, foreign engineers and scientists, uh, with their work going up to satellites and then down to laboratories in other countries. Uh, as fast as you have an insight, as fast as you have an invention, again, it's moving at the speed of, of light across national barriers. The same thing with money. We used to talk about national savings rates. And 10 years ago, 15 years ago, people assumed, and I think rightly 10 or 15 years ago, that national savings rates had a lot to do with the cost of capital. Well, these days, it's less true because national savings are sloshing across borders in search of the highest return on investment. Your capital, my capital, your savings, savings in Germany, again, are moving around the world. It's not so much that foreigners may suddenly take their money out of the United States if there is a better place to put it in another nation. We may take our money out of the United States if there's a better place to put it in another nation. And finally, corporations are also becoming global. What is an American corporation any longer when you realize that American corporations are increasing their investment outside the United States at about 15 to 20 percent a year over the last five years, increasing their investments inside the United States at an average of about six or seven percent a year? Who is us? Who is them? In this new world economy, the well, here's a trivial pursuit question. The number one exporter from Japan of computers last year was IBM. IBM. The number one employer in Singapore, of all Singaporean employers last year. Much harder question. Class? What? General Electric. Who said that? Put up your hand. It's in his book. You must have taken my class. Uh, my wife and I recently, we wanted to buy a new car because our old car died, and we went to, uh, well, we, we were sufficiently patriotic that we wanted to buy an American-made car. Uh, made by Americans, put together by We weren't sure, we went through a lot of soul searching, we weren't sure we wanted to make, we were so, so patriotic that we wanted to, to buy a car that was managed and engineered by Americans. And so we went to uh, a lot of different places, but I remember distinctly going to one uh, car manufacturer, a, um, a, a Nissan manufacturer, and, and we went to a Nissan dealership and we, we found a perfect car and I asked the Nissan dealer, was that car actually made here, assembled here in the United States by Americans? And he looked at me trying to decide, <laughs> was I one of those or was I one of those? And finally, he looked up at me with a, with a big smile and he said, well, which would you prefer? Again, who is us, who is them? The, the conclusion that I uh, came to uh, in, in my recent book is that basically the American economy can only be defined by the capacity of Americans, capacity of American workers, including all of us, everybody who's engaged in a productive process, to add value to this increasingly integrated world economy. Regardless of who they work for, regardless of their savings, their capacity to add value, their skills, their insights, their education, that is the essence of a national economy. And the problem of American competitiveness is that while the top 20% of Americans, college educated, good four-year colleges, probably good, often suburban high schools, many of them are adding substantially. They're problem solvers, they're conceptualizers, they understand how to identify problems. They're adding substantially to this new world economy and their real incomes over the last 12 to 15 years have gone up by about 11%. 
the bottom 80% or 70%, these people are unskilled, they have not been to college, they have a high school education at best, they are not adding substantial value. In fact, the world economy is putting them in direct competition with millions of other unskilled people, the vast majority of whom would be delighted to work for a small fraction of their wages. And hence, their real incomes over the past 12 to 15 years have declined. Non-supervisory workers, that includes about 65, 70% of Americans, non-supervisory workers in America right now have an income that is equivalent in inflation-adjusted terms to the income that they had in 1958. It takes two wage earners now to make a, a family income whole, whereas 15, 20 years ago you could do it with one wage earner. So again, we're seeing a divergence between the well-educated, the college graduate, and everybody else. In 1980, the college graduate on average in the United States was earning about 80% more than the non-college graduate. 1991, the college graduate is earning 190% more than the non-college graduate. We are, if we're not careful, becoming a two-tiered society. And the great failure, my conclusion, the great failure of American competitiveness has to do with the bottom 60, 70, 80%. Those people, former blue-collar workers, those people who are not becoming first-class citizens in the new world economy. Well, I only talk about all this stuff. There are other people who actually are on the front lines, on the battlefield. And four of those people are with us tonight to share with us their impressions. I want to introduce each of them in turn. Uh, and let me introduce, first of all, our, our first speaker. I was, I was thinking about introducing them all at once, but then I thought that it would confuse you and probably confuse me trying to do that. So I'm going to introduce them one by one. But first, I want to introduce uh, a dear old friend who is going to be speaking longest of our panelists because he's come from the longest distance. Uh, Bill Clinton uh, was first introduced to me uh, 23 years ago when we were on a, on a boat, on a ship heading to England, a bunch of us uh, graduate students. And uh, it was a five-day voyage. I don't remember too much about it because I spent three of those five days in my room down uh, quite green and thinking that I'd never recover and I'd never see the light of day again. But there was one person, one other graduate student among uh, all of us who were sailing in those days who kept on knocking on my door, bringing crackers and ginger ale and nursing me back to health. And his name was Bill Clinton. Uh, incidentally, the same person who's sitting right here. Uh, Bill went on after Oxford University in a very few years to become a governor of the state of Arkansas. And after that, he became governor of the state of Arkansas. And after that, governor of Arkansas. In fact, he did that five times. He has been now, I don't think anybody, except maybe Orville Forbes, Forbes has been governor of Arkansas as long as you, have you been? You look tired, Bill. One more. <laughs> In any, of, in any event, uh, Bill has also distinguished himself uh, by his commitment to raising Arkansas, building the workforce of Arkansas, investing in education, but perhaps more impo most importantly, helping the people of Arkansas understand the importance of investing in education and training and skills. Bill has also spread his wisdom and insights onto, na onto the national stage, now chairman of the Democratic Leadership uh, conference, also very, very active chairman of the National Governors Association in recent years, uh, a pioneer with regard to education and also health care. And I could go on and on and on, but I won't because I would embarrass him. Let me turn the podium over to my old and dear friend, Bill Clinton, Governor of Arkansas. I was just thinking, uh, how much simpler life would have been for the rest of us if I just let him die on that boat. <laughs> I don't know why <laughs> I, I don't know why I came all the way up here. Uh, I'm actually bitter at Bob. You know, he's written all these books made money, become a guru. When I first met him and I was telling him stories about Arkansas and what I was going to do, and he said, you're the only guy that ever won a Rhodes Scholarship that only had a two-digit IQ, but if you listen to me, son, I'll make you governor. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And uh, <laughs> the only reason I came here is that uh, I have to show up at odd times over the years so that he will continue to write books and I'll have something to talk about at home. <laughs> uh, Bob and Rick Stearns are sitting here in the front row who's now a judge. I really hate them both because they've got lifetime jobs and I keep being held to the mercy of the electorate, <laughs> which shows you that I probably don't belong here. But I'm very gratified to be asked. I, I was wondering what I could say about Bob's marvelous book, The Work of Nations. And I was reminded once, uh, almost 23 years ago, Bob and George Stearns here, and another Harvard alum named Alan Burson and I, went to hear the very famous American diplomat, George Kennan, who lectured at Oxford and who had written some fabulous books. And at this time, Mr. Kennan was extremely upset by the student revolt in America. And he thought the country was going to hell in a handbasket because of people like me and Bob and Rick. And uh, so he just ranted about it, you know. He just told everybody how terrible it was. And after it was over, we were all standing on the street, and I looked at Burson, and I said, well, Alan, what did you think of Kennan? And he looked at me without missing a beat, and he said, you know, the book was better than the movie. <laughs> and uh, I can say that for Bob, the book is good, but I don't think it'll ever be as good as the movie. I have benefited uh, <laughs> immensely from Bob Rice's writings over the years. I've learned to talk about paper entrepreneurialism. I knew I didn't like it. I just didn't know what it was called before he wrote about that. And uh, I learned to talk about how important it was to make the pie bigger instead of fighting over how to divide a shrinking pie. And uh, now I've got all my... I've even got my manuscript copy of the book here. He thinks I'm too cheap to buy it, but I actually have a hardcover. Uh, and I've underlined a lot of it. And one of the things that he said, and this is what I want you to remember tonight as we begin, there is a sentence in Bob's book, The Work of Nations, which says, Americans love to debate old categories. I believe that our country is faced self-evidently with enormous challenges. And most of us are bringing to the debate over what to do the shackles of old categories. Will we take a liberal or a conservative approach? Will we take a tax and spend approach or will we just preach at the problem? Will we say there's a national crisis but we hope someone else will do something about it? And I prefer to look at it in this way. We are still, in many ways, the greatest country in the world. If you look at the Gulf War, only the United States could have put together the political and military coalition necessary to effect that victory. And certainly it represented the triumph of a lot of our technology and the ability of young men and women to make it work after, in the case of the Patriot missiles, one year's worth of training, I might add. <laughs> but as we begin another work week today, 18 countries do a better job at the simple task of bringing babies into the world. At least a dozen do a better job of sending their men and women to work with the simple reading skills necessary to learn new jobs in an environment in which, as his book so ably points out, what you can earn is largely a function of what you can learn. At least 10 regularly wax us on international tests involving math and science knowledge. We're the only country in the world with no system for moving young people from high school to work into good jobs with good futures instead of dead-end jobs, the only country with an advanced economy. We're the only country in the world that can't seem to figure out how to provide health insurance to working men and women and their children. And we are first in another category this year for the first time. We uh, surpassed South Africa and the Soviet Union. And now we have the highest percentage of our people behind bars of any country in the world. And that statistic is very much related to the others that I just reeled off. Now, I am not a pessimist, but I can tell you that I find it disheartening that we have either not thought it was good form to discuss these problems for the last decade, or if we did, no one really wanted to take responsibility for them. And when they were raised, 
we saw people get into name calling about liberal or conservative or tax and spend or just preach at the problem. And what I would like to suggest to you is that, first of all, America spent too much time and money in the 1980s on the present and the past and too little attention and money on the future. If you look at the changing patterns of the federal budget, which is not the only thing you could look at, but just take that, you will see that we are spending a much bigger percentage of that budget today on present consumption and paying off the past than we are on the future. I define future as investments in education, infrastructure, research and development, and the environment. We're spending less on the future, more on the present and the past. This year, interest on the national debt will equal 60% of what all Americans pay in income taxes. That is an astonishing statistic. So I would argue to you the first thing we've got to make up our mind to do if we want our country to be a good country that keeps alive the American dream and that acts on the insights of Mr. Reich's book is we have to break out of the old categories and think about whether we are going to invest in the future whether the money comes from the private sector or the public sector. Each year in education, by the way, the private sector is spending almost two-thirds as much as the public sector is investing in education and training the workforce right now. If you agree with that, then we have to ask ourselves, what future are we going to invest in? What would we invest in? Here's what I think the public sector responsibilities are. Number one, consistent with the national education goals, we should make sure that all children show up for school mentally and physically ready to learn. That means basic primary and preventive health care from pregnancy until the kids show up at school. It means a preschool opportunity for every child who needs it. That means the federal government has to fully fund Head Start and do it soon, not somewhere in the distant future. And that states have to create their own funding streams for preschool because not everybody who needs preschool is income eligible for Head Start, and because there are other models which may work better. That's the first thing that has to be done. Secondly, we have to create in our states what the educators now call restructured schools with better trained principals and teachers who can lead letting the principals, the teachers, and the parents decide the course of the school and evaluating them on the results they get, regulating them less, supporting them more, using technology where appropriate, and setting very clear standards of what children should know when they get out. Third, we have to create a system of opportunity for the young people who are not going to college. The Grant Commission, on which my wife served about four years ago, was the first body which I saw point out that younger workers, 25 and under, are making about 28% less than their counterparts were 15 years ago if they have a high school diploma. If they dropped out of high school and went to work, the figure is something like 42%. Now this is an astonishing statistic. Why is that? It's not because we're lazy. Working people in America spent more time on the job and less time with their children in 1989 than they did in 1979. And it's certainly not because we're underpaid, as Mr. Decker will tell you, the average German manufacturing worker now in wages and fringes makes about 20% more than his American counterpart or her American counterpart. So we're not overpaid and we're not lazy. We're not properly educated and trained. We're not properly organized and led. And one of the things we need, we, we hate systems in America, but we must have a national apprenticeship system that moves young people who don't want to go to college or can't get in into good jobs with good futures. The next thing I think we need to do is to teach everybody with a job to read and give everybody who's got a job the opportunity to earn a GED. 80% of the workforce in the year 2000 is there now, maybe it's 85%. There are a phenomenal number of Americans who will go to work tomorrow who literally can't read at the 10th grade level. And this, most of what we'll say tonight will not relate to them at all. They, there's no way they can keep up with inflation, much less increase their earnings, unless they at least have basic literacy skills. 
Why haven't we done it? It is not very expensive. It's because we hate systems in America for public problems. We need to teach people to read in the workforce. We need to give them their GEDs in the workplace, as well as when they come before the courts or when they go to work education centers. It's very important. And finally, I think we need to make it possible for everyone who needs any aid to go on to college to get it, which means not just poor people, middle class people too. My friend Mr. Kuttner out there was one of the first people who said as long as four or five years ago that the Democratic Party, to which I belong, was shooting itself in the foot, means testing the middle class out of existence. Not only are middle class earnings declining, but the cost of health care, housing, and college education as a percentage of income have escalated dramatically, which aggravates the earnings decline. And the national administration has spent more than a decade now trying to abolish the student loan program because people rip it off and because they're philosophically opposed to helping middle class people go to college. I think that's nuts. So I believe we need a national program, either the national service concept where you get your college expenses paid and you've got to give a couple of years back as a teacher or a policeman, or some other form of scholarship that any middle class person can qualify for. Now, can this be done? In the legislative session we just concluded, the Arkansas legislature voted to raise the sales tax, the corporate income tax, and the gas tax to invest in the future. The State Chamber of Commerce asked us to raise the corporate income tax on the 1,500 wealthiest corporations in the state. As long as the money was targeted entirely to reorganizing and upgrading vocational education. There was broad support for raising the sales tax as long as the money was targeted to the very things I just mentioned to you. Preschool opportunities for people who needed it. Improvements in math and science and other instruction a statewide apprenticeship program, starting with 12 pilots, one of which I hope will be in the Siemens plant in Pulaski <laughs> County. A program to teach 30,000 more working Arkansans to read, moving toward 100,000 a year served by 1995, and eradicating the problem by 1996. And finally, a college scholarship program by, <clears throat> under which 80% of our high school seniors are eligible by income and to get $1,000 a year, which is the approximate annual tuition of our public schools. All they have to do is make a C-plus average in the recommended college core curriculum and a minimal score on the college entrance exam. They get $1,000 a year for four years. A tuition scholarship. Over and above any other scholarship they get, over and above any other loan they get, all they have to do is take the courses, make decent grades, stay off drugs, behave themselves, they get the money. It's an entitlement. We know that if you don't get at least two years of post high school education, you're going to get murdered in this economy. Unless we're going to a 230 day school year, we have got to send almost 100% of the high school graduates on for two years of further straining, either in a plant that will take care of it or in a school setting. It is not an option. If you believe anything in Bob's book, you got to believe that sending 55 percent of the high school graduates on to college is a recipe for social discord and economic disaster for America. What about the rest of them? Now that's what I think the public responsibility is. Very briefly, let me just make one other comment. I do not believe that the money alone is enough. I think we have to change the culture. We all have to be committed to world-class education and skills. We all have to believe we can do it. We have to b believe that Americans have to do what other countries do. We have to organize our way into a system that will have predictable results. Nearly every problem in American education has been solved by somebody somewhere, and we just hate to copy one another. In Boston, Massachusetts, Robert Benswanger at the Boston Latin Academy has given us a sterling example about how to take kids from low-income families with enormous obstacles who have average IQs and get them all out of high school and darn near all of them to college. Just go look at it. They're in an old garage. I, I think they're about to get in a new building. No lockers, no auditorium, no sports facilities. Teachers don't have parking places. The teachers have to apply to teach there. The seniors and juniors have to help the younger kids. You have to do all kinds of 
crazy things like take six years of math and from seventh grade through twelfth and four years of Latin. The kids take home an average of 30 pounds of books a night and a lot of them have to study in their bathroom because that's the only place they have and 95% of them finish and over 80% of them go on to college. Why can't we do that somewhere else? We need leadership academies in every state to replicate those things. You have to change the culture. I think we ought to teach values in the schools. I realize this is a little dicey. I was on the, uh, I was on a commission, the Carnegie Commission on middle school years a few years ago with former Governor Kane of New Jersey. And we recommended that our schools ought to teach citizenship, honesty, respect for self, others, and the environment openly and teach people that they had responsibilities to one another and try to imbue elemental concepts like the relationship of effort to reward in our children. You may think that's silly, but a lot of these kids come to school from environments of total chaos in which they have been robbed of their childhoods, and they need that. That is a cultural support system they desperately need. I think the school should impose certain responsibilities on students and their parents. A lot of you may think this is kind of hokey, but in our state you can be fined if you're a parent and you're asked to show up at a parent-teacher conference and your child's in trouble and you refuse to do it, you can be fined. The school can have you fined. If you permit your child to remain constantly absent from school, you can be fined. You can't get or, kid, get or keep a driver's license if you drop out of school for no good reason. I think those things are important. Not that it affects a lot of people, but it changes the culture, sends out a different set of values, messages about what's important. And there are several other things that I don't want to take up a lot of time, I want to hear the other panelists. But we need a commitment to invest in the future. We need accountability and cultural changes. And we need to believe that we can do this. And I can just tell you for what it's worth, I think that if we don't, you can protect the American economy till the cows come home and the jobs will still go overseas. And if you let 10 or 20 more years go on where the middle class keeps losing ground, this won't be the America any of us grew up in. And I will say again, it is a question of organization, will, and leadership. It has nothing to do with the American people. The people in my state, which is 47th in per capita income, work harder and have better values and want to do more than any people I've ever seen in my life. It is not their fault. They are doing the very best they can. They have not been properly led. And I hope that uh, this will be the beginning of turning that around. If it is, we'll owe a lot of it to Bob Reich. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Governor, uh, the book is $24. It's available at the... <laughs> We've heard from uh, the public sector and the future public sector. I want to turn now to our panelists uh, from the private sector. We have three leaders of the private sector, large corporations, global corporations. And uh, let me turn now, first of all, to Dr. Hans Decker. Uh, Hans is vice chairman of Siemens Corporation, which is a holding company for the Siemens U.S. Cor operation. Siemens, by the way, is a very small mom and pop uh, operation. <laughs> it's, uh, it employs 365,000 people in 124 nations, has an annual worldwide sales of about $33 billion. Uh, Mr. Decker, uh, Dr. Decker has served as executive of the Central Finance Division of Siemens AG at the company's headquarters in Munich, Germany, prior to his U.S. assignment 19 years ago. He received his doctorate in law in 1958 from the University of Heidelberg. Uh, it, this is an important point. In the United States, Siemens has annual sales of $4 billion, and Siemens employs 31,000 Americans at 60 manufacturing and assembly plants, 450 sales and service locations, and 25 research and development laboratories. Hans? <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Bob. Uh, I only wish that the German school system and education system would produce speakers like Governor Clinton. <laughs> but now you have to do with the product of the German school system, and you will see the difference. 
um, when I saw the, um, the final wording for uh, the title of tonight, our, preparing our workforce for the next century, I could hear my own sigh of relief because I first thought it was something like, who is us? Does corporate nationality matter? <laughs> Not that this question wasn't very fascinating, intriguing, all sorts of things, but certainly very much so for, a, for an academics seminar. What comes to mind, of course, is the role of the nation state, corporate nationality indeed, or does ownership matter, does it? What actually is a global company? Is Siemens a global company? I don't know. By the way, I saw Arco Forum here. Arco reminds me that we indeed bought from Arco the solar business of theirs, so maybe that is some indication of, of global, I don't know. Or do we really, as uh, some of your critics of the book, of course, have mentioned all the time, are we already living in an age of global business? You can question that. These are all very fascinating things, but I did wonder and still do wonder, do we really have to answer all those questions? Are they indeed imperative to come to the core of Bob Rice's question? At least that's what I think in his conclusion. That is, what really matters is the workforce and the education of the workforce. And I think for that conclusion, that this does matter, we don't necessarily have to answer that other question. Although, in a give and take here, we might want to take it up. So, um, I want to skip that, although for a moment when I read our workforce, I thought we were back to square number one, and the question was indeed, who is us? But I skip that for a moment at least and think us is the U.S. workforce, or maybe other workforces like the German or maybe even the Japanese. Now, we all know about the inadequacy of the U.S. workforce, and Governor Clinton has uh, made a few points uh, in that respect, the statistics are, of course, are dismal and all of that. And Bob Reich has, of course, looked at it in a different way here with his three categories, symbolic analyst and so on. And as he said, and I fully concur, uh, I think there is no match in the world in terms of education symbolic analyst. That's the best education for those people, of course, is in the United States. But then we hear, of course, of corporate people making all sorts of pious talks about the private sector, what they do, how much money they spend, and I think you're right, Bob, they spend money, but then they take money also through all sorts of tax abatements. But that's a different story. But I think what we really have to look at, what is the proper role of the private sector? And in particular, with respect to those 70 or so, 80% of people who are not the higher ups, those who really need to be better educated because that's where the competition really is. Now that leads me immediately to the German system of dealing exactly with those people, with the 70 or 80 percent that are below that level. And um, the word was used here by Governor Clinton, apprenticeship. I use it with a certain hesitation because I do know that there is some connotation carried with that term here, but I think still for the purpose of tonight we want to talk about the German, or for that matter the German, Swiss and Austrian apprenticeship system and just have a quick look at uh, what that means and what that does to that particular workforce. Not by the way that I think that can be transplanted here, lock, stock and barrel or so, but I think there are some, some important ingredients in that um, system there that we can use uh, in the United States as well. Uh, you know about the famous um, concept of the German Meister, the master craftsman, who is the sort of the uh, coveted uh, and well-respected member of the profession, of, the, of business, but also of society. Now, how does that work in Germany, or let's say in particular uh, for Siemens? Siemens does that kind of um, training for their people for almost 100 years by now. And right now we have about 15,000 young people 
employed in the, in the capacity as an apprentice in Germany, about 60 locations in Germany. And by the way, in the whole of Germany, we think there is about a million young people, of course, uh, male and female, who are going through that uh, system. It usually takes between three and four years of uh, training, age 15, 18, 16, 19 or so, and they call it the dual system. Dual because it does two things. It trains people right in the workshop, right there, for say three days a week, as an average matter, and for two days those young people go to school, to a vocational school, which is run by the state. But there are instances, for instance, with Siemens, where we run our own school, as it were, for that purpose. There are about 50 or so crafts, occupations, trades, that we uh, train young people in. Uh, and there are, in our case in particular, there are either in the industrial electrical trade or the mechanical trade or related. And um, we do that, by the way, not only in Germany. We do it in other countries uh, where we do business. Uh, practically all over the world. And um, of course, it costs the company money. We pay about 40,000 or so Deutsche Mark per student, per trainee, uh, per year. But we do think, and that's the main point, we do think that this is an investment. It's not just an expense, it's an investment that uh, pays well. And by the way, it pays well in one other respect, about 85. 85% of those people stay with the company. They do stay, although there is no contractual relationship. They could go uh, somewhere else. But I think what really counts here, and that was also mentioned in uh, Governor Clinton's uh, remarks, it's not so much the skills that come with that training. Of course they do. Very well grounded and, as a matter of fact, rather um, is they start at least in the first year with a rather broad base and then go on to specifics, but what really counts is the mindset that comes with it, the value, the value system, the respect and all of that. Because if you go through that system for, say, three or four years, you not only learn, as I said, those skills, you learn what a relationship is, a relationship with a company, a relationship with, with the work you do, a relationship what, with what quality means. Quality is a big factor, as we all know, also relating to our uh, trade uh, picture and deficit. Quality, those things come with this kind of a relationship that uh, comes and goes over years. Teamwork, they don't work just one by one, they work in a team, and as uh, also Governor Clinton says, maybe Americans don't like systems. Systems is really what the future is all about, on, also in business. By systems, we mean not just doing or delivering or producing one product. You offer a system, something that hangs together, something that somebody wants, which you also could call, could call a solution, a solution for a problem. People in particular in our field with Siemens, they don't want to just buy something from us. They want us as a partner, really, as a partnership to offer them a solution for their problems. So all of those things come with this kind of a apprenticeship type uh, training that um, is the heart of, uh, of the Siemens uh, business and I do believe it's also the heart of the German system in total. If you were to ask, was there indeed a, an economic miracle in Germany after World War II? Is there maybe even you could ask a repeat now when the eastern part of Germany is being integrated. I do believe that one of the most important ingredients of this was and still is this very system, this system of an apprenticeship training for young people because it does, as I said, uh, transfer and confer those skills and also this mindset that, go with it, that goes with it. Now, just as a last uh, remark, um, you might ask by now, what about doing the same thing in this country? Now, we've looked at that, of course. When we first got alarmed, when we read all the dismal things about the American educational system and all the statistics, and we asked ourselves, what did we find in our place with the 30,000 people we do employ? Now, fortunately, I can say it isn't that bad, but we do know that 
in five or 10 years, it might be different. So we do look at that and we are at a point right now where we will probably open a first model pilot system of an apprenticeship uh, place for our own purposes, of course. But by doing so, we hope we make a dent, maybe, maybe even within this year. So we are about to embark on this very system to bring it here to America. Thank you. Well, Hans, it would be ironic if uh, Siemens provided the model for an American apprenticeship system. Uh, by the way, I should uh, point out that the United States private sector is spending or claims to be spending about $30 billion a year on training of American workers. But if you get close to that figure, you see that approximately $26 billion of that $30 billion is spent on workers who already have college educations, managing, management, professional, technical workers. In fact, if you are college educated, you're twice as likely to be trained by American corporations as if you're just high school educated. If you have a graduate degree, you're twice as likely to be trained and get more training than if you have a college degree. So again, we're back to the central puzzle, the central problem. What are we doing, public sector and private sector, for the non-college bound? For the kid, the 60%, 70%, 75 or 80% that are not going on to become as I call it, symbolic analysts. Our next speaker, Dr. Ellen Frost, is Corporate Director, International Affairs for United Technologies. Uh, Dr. Frost uh, has served as Director of Government Programs, U.S.-Japan Relations, in the we Washington office of Westinghouse Electric Corporation. And before that, she was Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Economic and Technology Affairs at the Department of Defense. Uh, Dr. Frost is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations in New York and the International Institute of Strategic Studies in London, and she holds a PhD degree from, of all places, Harvard University. <laughs> Ellen? Thank you, Bob. If you don't like what I have to say, it's obviously the fault of this institution. <clears throat> My company is very small, a mere 200,000 people. Um, I'm going to do something that I hope will be a, a provocative here. I'm going to grant Bob Reich a lot of his assumptions uh, about a desirable future because, in fact, I ag agree with most of them. And then I want to use some real-life uh, cases that I'm working on um, to draw your attention uh, not to this undifferentiated mass called the bottom 80%, but a group of people who, in fact, probably just have high school education, maybe a technical degree beyond that, but they never expected to get caught up in this world of global technology. And I want to come back to that point uh, as, I, as I proceed. So I'm going to assume that we all uh, develop a sense of national purpose, which uh, Bob defines, I think, brilliantly as a principled uh, historical and cultural connection to a common political endeavor. And we, we in, the, in the private sector have now got techno-patriotism. I don't like this positive economic national <laughs> techno-patriotism. And we have uh, developed a good science and technology education for our students, and we have, in fact, focused on the capacity to add value, and I'm, I'm taking that as, 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 as given, uh, and, and now I want to get to what I see in sort of the, the here and now real life. I'm going to give you a couple of examples, um, starting with um, a, 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 a transfer of people and technology that is working out fairly smoothly and transitioning from there into uh, some much more difficult uh, areas. Um, and then I want to tell you what I think the consequences are for uh, public policy. Um, the first example I have is elevators. Now, you may think that <clears throat> elevators is low tech. On the contrary, you haven't been to Japan if you think that elevators are low tech. Imagine you walk into the building, the elevator senses that you're there, comes down, it's all programmed for rush hour, up and down, it descends automatically in the morning and so forth and so on. You get in, the door's shut, you say curses, the elevator's broken, three seconds later you're on the 17th floor. I mean, it is getting to be a very high-tech business and uh, the division that um, 
we, uh, or that you know as, as Otis uh, Elevator Division, is in fact manufacturing in Japan. And by satisfying the world's fussiest customers, it claims, uh, and I believe them, that they are in a position to drive quality and technology for their entire global business. And they are represented in practically every country um, in this increasingly high-tech business. Now, here's a hint as to what I'm getting at. They can do this because they have pe policies that move people around uh, a lot. They have a culture that tells them it's a global business. They can work cheek by jowl with each other. They can learn foreign languages enough to read uh, technical manuals and the like. Example two, Motorola. Um, a very impressive company um, in recent years, uh, almost driven into the ground by the Japanese. One of the things they do in their annual human resources review, their personnel review, is they have something called the technology roadmap. It's very simple. They make everybody answer these questions. What is your customer going to want 10 years from now? What technologies are needed to make what the customer is going to want 10 years from now? Who owns or is developing those technologies? And if it ain't you, how are you going to get them? You see how brilliant it is. You start with a customer, you start with the future, and you work back to the present. So the light bulb goes on in your head. And here you are, a guy who's worked in uh, you know, uh, uh, the business but has never really learned uh, how to get technology from abroad. How are you going to do it? Suppose the guy that has the technology you need is in Japan. What are you going to do? This is a kind of a skill. We haven't even learned quite how to define it yet. But it's more than science and technology. Now you take something like the aerospace industry and enter the villain called the not invented here syndrome. I mean, we are, you know, number one, right? And we are number one. We are still number one. It's a major, um, I think if I'm correct, Bob, that it's next to chemicals. I think it's the only manufactured export that's still in significant surplus or something. Anyway, billions of dollars and lots of technology. Um, Lo and behold, uh, there are other com countries with aerospace uh, ambitions. We have, in fact, transferred technology around the world through co-production programs in the military sector. And these countries have ambitions of their own. Some of them uh, have developed very significant capabilities uh, in Europe and Japan particularly. Uh, how are we going to force um, our engineers to learn about composite materials or to learn about uh, how to build exactly the right uh, degree of, of tolerance and how to use fancy new machines and all of that if that skill doesn't happen to be here. Um, and when you look at something like the high-speed civil transport program, which is a kind of, I don't know, grandson of Concord, I guess, um, we see this uh, a, a very live and real issue. And we, for one, are doing an awful lot of learning as to how to learn. Um, the um, Looking to the future, um, the last example I want to cite here is something called the Intelligent Manufacturing Systems. This is a research proposal put forward by Japan, and the U.S. government and the EC are negotiating on the terms of reference. What do you mean intelligent manufacturing? It's everything from soup to nuts from the design phase through manufacturing through sales using a common language and common standards and common um, machine talk and, and computers. It's uh, uh, using intelligent materials that remember their shape, designing new cutting tools to match the intelligent material. It's a, it's a range of, of issues that we have barely begun to think about as a nation. And one of the most interesting things about the, this program is the private-public interaction. And here's where I'm going to talk just quickly about the public uh, responsibility. Because when the Japanese came to the American uh, companies, uh, we said, sure, we're smart enough to do this without losing our shirts. You know, we're doing our benchmarking and we know what we want to keep and what we want to transfer and what we want to get. Uh, and the Commerce Department didn't believe us. <clears throat> they said, aha, you're competing for uh, a sale in the aerospace sector, which happened to be true, and you're promising all the goodies, you know, to make yourselves popular in, in, uh, in Japan. Uh, and there was quite a lot of, of, uh, t of t arguing uh, back and forth. The Europeans wouldn't even permit the Japanese to talk directly to the companies. They were so suspicious. And everybody kind of circled around the Japanese, you know, who, who said to us, but, you know, you've been telling us to share technology, and you, you told us we were good in manufacturing. You know, what's the matter with us? Here, here, here's this great program. Why don't you just sign up? 
Well, we did sign up, and, and uh, the uh, disagreements, I think, among the government and private sector actors have been sorted out. But one of the interesting things was it revealed that we don't, as a nation, know how to build a consensus and to build a team. We started saying to ourselves, gee, before we cooperate with the Japanese, maybe we should have a national manufacturing program. Well, great, now where do we put it? A university? Do we put it in a federal center? What do we do? And, and how do we pick teams? Uh, and, and how do we uh, you know, hold meetings? We have to put it in the federal register because we'll be in violation of the this and that law if we don't do it and so forth and so on. It's been very complicated and very instructive and it shows us that one of the things that government can do is to set a sense of where the country is going in the 21st century to set a tone of urgency uh, such as Governor Clinton uh, struck, to treat this as, as a real um, national security challenge. Now, you know, Americans don't like industrial policy, right? No, no, that's terrible, Bob. Don't ever say industrial policy. But they love national security. And let us recall the National Defense, the National Defense Foreign Languages Act. I studied Chinese at Harvard with some money from them. The National Defense Education Act. National defense makes it okay. And I think we need a president and an administration that sets a tone of urgency and defines these issues you know, as a real national security challenge to our future. I think that's the point at which, <laughs> that's, that's uh, the point I think at which I will, um, I will stop. Um, but I'm, um, uh, that is in fact the most significant uh, point that I, that I want to make. Um, so I do, coming back to Bob's point, it's, I don't uh, for a minute disagree with you, but I want to, remind you that it's people that move technology around in your global world and, and it's people who often don't have the necessary education to do it even if they know their engineering. Thank you, Ellen. So we use uh, the, the answer to uh, Governor Clinton's question about uh, why Americans don't like systems is to use the national security pretext. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> Edson De Castro is founder and former chairman of the board of directors of Data General Corporation. Uh, Ed was responsible for the designs of the original Nova computers, and prior to forming Data General, he held design engineering positions with Digital Equipment Corporation. Uh, Mr. DeCastro has a BS in electrical engineering from the University of Lowell, Massachusetts. He has had a lot of uh, honorary degrees in his time. Uh, he is a founder and executive committee member of the Massachusetts High Technology Council, which has had very definite views about Massachusetts education and Massachusetts public financing. He has served as a director of the American Electronics Association and its New England chapter, he is on the board of uh, trustees of Boston University, and was a member of the Massachusetts Capital Development Task Force in 1976, and of Governor Edward King's Management Task Force in 1978. Ed? Well, thank you, Bob, and good evening. Um, Bob Reich told you that the better educated people in this country, the top 20 or 30 percent, are beginning to reap a greater and greater share of the income in this country. Governor Clinton told you that he had a plan, a plan to help improve the skills, the ability, the education of that other 70 or 80 percent of the people. I'm here to tell you tonight, first off, that the top 20 or 30 percent, yeah, that's you and I, are the cause of the problem. And that even if Governor Clinton is successful in better educating the other 70 or 80 percent, we're probably not going to have any jobs for him unless we do some things. I'd like to go back just a minute to the roots of the problem. First off, I want to tell you I'm an optimist. I'm not here to tell you about doom and gloom. But you should recognize that anybody who can stand here before you in this kind of an economy, unemployed those with the years. The United States standard of living was double that of every other country in the world. We were the world's leading exporter of oil. Our standard of living was improving at a dramatic rate. And we all recognized that life for our children could only be much better than it was for us. 
We were happily driving around in our Studebakers, our Dodges, our DeSotos. We were watching our television sets made by the likes of Philco and Admiral. We'd just gotten the latest in consumer electronics. Hmm, I wonder what happened. Americans don't even make consumer electronics anymore. Wonder whose fault that was. Must have been the politicians. They always take the short-term view of everything. Business people, of course, are defenders of our free enterprise system. They practice open, free economics for the betterment of everybody in the country. Couldn't have been business people who brought us the junk bond, the leverage buyout, shoddy quality automobiles and consumer electronics that turned consumers to foreign suppliers. Well, actually, I'm an engineer anyway. So. And engineers, of course, are bastions of strength. They uh, use the very latest in technology to uh, bring the consumer the very best possible product at the lowest cost. Um, couldn't have been them who had anything to do with unsafe nuclear power plants or uh, fenders that don't fit or any of those kinds of things. Or, I mean, it couldn't have been them who designed poor TV sets that caused people to buy Japanese. Or was it? As I told you in the beginning, the top tier of educated people, you and I, are responsible for the problem. Well, what is the problem? The problem is really twofold. It's cultural and it's institutional. When we talk about competitiveness problems, that's kind of a euphemism for the problem we're having with Japan. Yeah, there are some other foreign competitiveness problems, but Japan's really the target of all this. I've had the opportunity to travel a fair bit in Japan. And frankly, I like Japan. I enjoy going to that country. It's very interesting, but it is very different. The culture in Japan is very different from ours. I've had the opportunity to spend some time there and do some sightseeing. And I've seen some fairly interesting things. I happened to be there on a spring weekend a number of years ago. And I'd taken my daughter with me to see the country. And we went out in Tokyo to kind of tour around, see what was going on. And in this particular Sunday, they would blocked off several of the streets in Tokyo so people could go out and party. And just as you might find in America, there were bands and there were people out dancing and the restaurants in the area had moved their tables out onto the sidewalk so people could eat and enjoy the outdoors. It all sounds like what you'd find in America, with one exception. You could not find one scrap of paper, refuse, food, or anything on the streets. The Japanese people care enough about the well-being of their fellow citizens to take and put that in appropriate trash containers. If you go to a construction site in Japan, you'll find a washing machine. This machine is designed so when the trucks exit that construction site in the middle of the city, all of the dirt will be cleaned off that truck so it won't track it out onto the public streets. If you go to a phone booth, you'll find an instrument sitting on a table which is connected by a small wire off to the network. And it's just sitting there on the table. That thing wouldn't last a week here in Boston or half an hour in New York. <laughs> but in Tokyo, it's sitting there waiting for you to use it. If you go to a railroad station, you'll find a number of bicycles there. People who have ridden their bicycles to the train and then take the train on to wherever they're going. None of them locked and they'll all be waiting for their owner when he returns. Okay, so what's the point of all this? Japan is a culture of the collective. We're a culture of the individual. Japanese people are taught from their very earliest years to respect the needs of the society, or the institution, or the corporation, or whatever it is they happen to belong to as a whole, more than they respect their own personal needs. We're brought up to be rugged individuals to recognize that if we take good care of ourselves and everybody else takes good care of themselves, within the context of our system, it'll all work out. 
Now, this isn't necessarily bad, but it's different. And it leads to quite different industrial strengths, and we need to recognize it. Just to give you a couple of quick examples, we're fast seeing our semiconductor industry evaporate to Japan. No great surprise. In Japan, the people who work for a corporation have the collective interest of that organization more at heart than they do their own personal interest, or they recognize their own personal interest is best served by seeing the best interest of that corporation served. When you want to design a world-class semiconductor, the first thing you need is a world-class team of engineers, scientists, production people, and you need them dedicated to this task for a long period of time. That means early designs, initial prototypes, changes, put it into production, and stick with this process for a long time, probably four or five years, where you keep improving the yield one step at a time until you've got the very lowest cost, highest quality product. In Japan, you can find such a team. You can assign them to the project, and they'll continue with it throughout its life. In America, you can get the very best people at the early stage. They'll do the first designs, the early prototypes, but then they want to turn it over to some <coughs> lower form of humanity who's going to go through all this dog work for the next three or four years. And it just plain doesn't work as well. Now let me give you the flip side of that coin. For those of you who are computer nicks, who have a personal computer at home and enjoy playing around with it and like to look at new software, get out to a software store, a computer store, and have a look at some of the Japanese software. It won't take you long, because there isn't much, if any. And the reason for that is also cultural. In America, people are free of these bounds, bounds of loyalty to their organization. They're free to go start their own company, to do their own thing, to run off in their garage with a couple of colleagues. And software, it turns out, seems to get done better that way within the context of small entrepreneurial organizations where people are free to go and do their own thing. So the U.S. today dominates the world in software. And sure, the Japanese are working hard, and sure, they're going to make some progress, but they have fundamental cultural disadvantage. Lastly, and I know I'm talking way too long, we have some institutional issues. Americans have an incredibly short-term point of view. And some of the jobs we need to do are just, just plain take a long time. They take a lot of capital, and you've got to stick with it. I happen to believe that one of the most important drivers of that short-term point of view comes out of our financial institutions. Our stock market today is more of a casino than it is a provider of long-term capital for the development of American industry. And I think we ought to fix that. And it's not all that hard to do. I suspect if we took the money that's today raised from the capital gains tax and raise that instead with a security transfer tax so that every time you churned your portfolio, you paid a little more as opposed to having paid it at the end when you made money, that we'd see a remarkable change in the way Americans invest their money. And I know the security industry has lobbied long and hard against this because they claim it would reduce trading volume, and I think they're absolutely right. <laughs> well, I've far overstayed my welcome here this evening, and. Uh, I think at this point, I better turn it back to Bob. Thank you very much. Ed, thank you. We now uh, have a chance for questions and for discussion. We've had a, a variety. I haven't heard anybody on our panel really fundamentally disagree with my diagnosis of the problem, and that is that the top 20% are doing better. They have the skills. They have the insights. They are becoming more competitive but the bottom 70, 80% are doing worse. Uh, nobody disagrees in part because I selected the panel. <laughs> but you can disagree, 
and I invite you to. We've heard a variety of, of, of prescriptions with regard to that diagnosis. Governor Bill Clinton talks about not only investing in the bottom 80% with regard to preschool, prenatal, postnatal, Head Start, K through 12, also creating a climate of investment, also providing the right systems and leadership to make that investment possible. Uh, Ellen Frost talked about using national security perhaps as a pretext uh, for that sense of, of crisis and, under, and understanding what has to be done. Hans Decker talked about apprenticeships, talked about what the private sector could do, an apprenticeship program in which something like uh, 80, 90 percent of the non-college bound in Germany, and maybe Hans, if you're successful in the United States, actually has technical training that leads to specific jobs in the private sector. And Ed De Castro talked about changing the culture, and at the very least, getting rid of the investment bankers. <laughs> or, no, uh, actually putting a small transfer tax. And the Massachusetts High Technology Council, I think, is officially proposing a small transfer tax on shares of stock, I understand it. And now it's your turn. Uh, let me ask you, uh, both with regard to descriptions of the problem, but also with regard to any questions you have for any of our, any of our panelists, please, now is your opportunity. If we haven't provoked you, we haven't been doing our job. There is one uh, microphone right there. There's another microphone over here, and we have about uh, 15 minutes. Yes. Uh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't take issue with the, with the importance of education and initiatives to, Im to improve education in this country for that uh, disenfranchised majority. But it just seems that as long as, as you said, there are people in other parts of the world willing to do the same job for substantially less because incomes are so much lower and standards of living are so much lower. It just seems like a very natural and not entirely wrong process for jobs to move abroad. And as long as much of the world lives in, in incredible poverty, that doesn't strike me as horribly wrong. It, it, it might, I, I know that that doesn't play well politically in this country because none of those people vote in this country. Uh, but it, it just seems like thinking of it as a human being, maybe it's not such a horrible thing for jobs to, to, to go abroad. Do you want to identify yourself? I'm sorry, I didn't know. My name is George Fisher. George. Uh, panelists, uh, question uh, is, I don't think any of us implied that movement of jobs uh, abroad was necessarily bad. In fact, uh, I think it's probably uh, good and necessary. It's a way to increase world wealth. The question is, as jobs move abroad, particularly unskilled jobs, how do we at least raise the skill level in the United States and supplement that with infrastructure so that we can continue to earn well? But let me ask, uh, on the issue of protectionism, on the issue of domestic content, uh, how our guests, uh, guests feel. And let me uh, start by putting Governor Clinton right on the hot spot. U.S.-Mexican trade agreement. Are you for or against? I'm for it. Good for you. <laughs> But don't mince words. Uh, you're a politician. I want you to get but, right to the heart me, of the issue. Let me just issue. follow up on what you said. I, I agree with you, and I think that what we should try to do is to support growth in other countries. Let me give you, I don't want to bore you with a bunch of numbers, but if the growth rates in Latin America in the last five years had been what they were in the middle years of the 70s, our trade deficit would have been reduced by approximately 20 percent. So it's not only a humane thing to do, it is a good thing for us to try to spark the increase of global growth. That's the only way a rich country can maintain the growing incomes. Again, I hate to beat a dead horse, but you've got another systematic problem here. We have no, our trade adjustment program is woefully inadequate. In, and insufficiently targeted, I think. So a lot of people get hurt when these economic changes occur who, if they really had access to adequate training programs and targeted opportunities, wouldn't be left in the lurch for so long. But we can't avoid uh, promoting global economic growth, I think. It would be a terrible thing for our country to do that. Uh, Ellen and then Hunt. Yeah, um, we employ about 12,000 people in Mexico. Um, but, you know, some of our plants there are newer and more modern than some of our plants in the United States. All of them are tied with our plants in the United States, and it's our view 
and I think we can prove this, that by doing some manufacturing in Mexico and certain product lines, we've been able to keep an integrated North American market going for our product against uh, very severe competition from uh, East Asia. So we don't see it as a zero-sum uh, investment at all. The, the second, and I know that wasn't the point of the speaker, but the second point, um, responding more directly to the questioner, is that, you know, I don't think companies invest abroad uh, in general primarily on the basis of wages. I mean, if they did, you'd find us all rushing to Haiti, or you would find our European investments all in southern Europe. We've just um, made a major strategic alliance with, guess what, a German company, Daimler-Benz, um, because of access to quality and technology and educated workers and getting inside the European market. So there are lots and lots of reasons why companies invest overseas, and I would say that wages is really one of the more minor ones. I, uh, first of all, I want to answer your question, Bob, as to protectionism. Of course, philosophically, conceptually, it bothers me a lot, but in reality, with Siemens, where it is in the U.S. now, of those four or 4.5 billion, over 80 percent of that is what we call local content. In other words, things manufactured here, values added here. So, and th then we export about 15 percent of our total. So we are not that much bothered by it in reality, but otherwise. But then I would echo what Alan just said, and that's exactly what it is, and that's an answer to your question. We don't move around jobs just because wages are so, and that's a slight criticism, by the way, of what you said in your book, Bob. Now for the first time, maybe. It's not what it is at all. I mean, we are in, in this country here with 30,000 people, and we will probably add a good number to that. And the reason is very simple, and you were alluding to that, Alan. We, we go to a place for strategic reason, which sounds a little abstract and bombastic, but what it really means is, in particular in our business, it's similar to yours, the customer wants us to be on the spot, onshore. They don't want us to be 5,000 miles away with the brains and just a few people doing a little job here. They want us to be here to be their partner, as I said before, to be their helper in, solu in, in solving their problems. So we come here to be here as part of the, an integral part of the economy, and we will continue doing that. So it's not as easy as it sounds. You move jobs around because it's a little cheaper there. Maybe, maybe that's true for semiconductors and a few other things, Sorry, but not for the bulk of industrial goods. Preston. Yeah, Preston Foster. Uh, we asked this question of Professor Reich, and um, since we have politicians here and, <coughs> excuse me, business leaders, let's pose it to you as well. Assuming that we all agree with Professor Reich, which we seem to, how would we articulate um, our solutions to the public such that they would resonate with them, say, in 1992, uh, Governor Clinton? Um, <laughs> Just such that date. <laughs> it could counter the uh, conservative populists who accuse his solutions and as filtering down to more tax and tax and spend solutions. Well, I think let me try to go back over what I attempted to say in my opening remarks. I think if it just becomes a a tax and spend deal where people think you're charging them more for the same kind of government, that's a losing debate. So that if you let that, again, I'm, I'll go back to, to Bob's sentence in the book, Americans love to debate old categories. The only way you can do it is to break out of those categories and say, uh, look at these other countries that have higher growth rates, lower unemployment rates, and higher real incomes. What do they do differently? They invest more in the future, they educate their people better, and they organize their economies more uh, adequately for global competition. Let's take this federal d budget and divide it into expenditures on the past, the present, and the future. On the present, we will live within our means, defined as not Graham Rudman, which is an accounting gimmick, but actually what the American people earned the year before. We won't increase current consumption more than American incomes increase. And if we increase the deficit, our taxes, it will be on the future. And we'll show you what you get, and we'll get, we'll dedicate the taxes, and you can decide whether you think the investment is worth it. And keep in mind, a lot of this has to be done at the state and local level. A lot of it has to be done in the private sector. But I, I think there's a lot of evidence that the American people will support that sort of target and investment. I didn't tell you this in the beginning, but the, I told you we raised those taxes for education and training. 
uh, that, well, there were th and infrastructure, there were three taxes, the fuel tax for a four-lane road program, the corporate income tax for the job training program, and the sales tax for the education opportunity program. They were voted on in each house, so they were voted on six times. They all got between 76 and 100 percent of the legislature to vote for them, and a majority of the Republicans voted for them. We put aside party, region, race, everything to try to do what seemed self-evidently in the interest of the people of our state. I think the country would respond. And someone said, maybe Bob, someone, I'm not sure you're talking about such a big tax increase. A lot of this stuff we're talking about is not much money. But you have to have a whole lot of discipline in how much you let current consumption expenditures increase if you want to save something for the future. If I could just ask the panelists on the basis of uh, Governor Bill, your remarks just now. Uh, the top 20 percent of income earners last year took home, we all know, a little over half of the national income, more than the bottom 80 percent put together. If there is going to be any more discretionary spending on education, training, infrastructure, preschool, Head Start, and so forth, the discretionary income is in the top 20 percent. So even though it, we may not ta be talking about gigantic figures, we are still talking about some degree of sacrifice on the part of the top 20 percent with regard to increasing the productivity of the bottom 80. Uh, and I ask you all, uh, Bill, you included, can we get the top 20 percent in a global economy to feel that degree of connection, that degree of willingness to invest in the productivity of the bottom 80 percent when it's no longer possible to make the old argument we used to be able to make that is, that it's in your enlightened self-interest to do so because we're all in the same boat together. We're no longer in the same boat together. My neighbor is a computer engineer working for Siemens on a big project, financed out of Tokyo, with a routine computer coding being done in Bulgaria. The hardware is being put together in Mexico. I say to my neighbor, you have a stake in the education of kids in Cambridge or Chelsea or Somerville? Well, it's not as clear as it used to be. Can we get the top 20 percent to make those kinds of commitments in a global economy? I don't want to evade that particular question, Bob, but my first point would you be... You want to evade that is, question? No. Hans, is that what you said? But my, my first point would be my anecdotal evidence tells me that there is, I shouldn't say maybe enough money around, but there is lots of money around for education that is not used properly. A good deal of that. Well, let's stipulate. Let, let's stipulate that we have to use this money more, better. Uh, but uh, is that all we need to do? Is there, in other words, are we investing enough in education training? Remember, we're talking about preschool, Head Start, prenatal, postnatal, all of the aspects of human capital development. Are we, is there enough money there? Is it just simply a matter of not spending it well enough? A good deal of that. Ed? I'm not in the upper 20 percent. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I, I think there is enough money there, and, and we're not spending it well enough. Um, you know, if we look at the educational systems of some of the competitor nations, uh, Germany, for instance, uh, and Japan, we find that uh, the per capita expenditures are pretty similar to ours. Even, even a little higher here. Uh, and uh, they're, they're doing pretty well. Um, I, I kind of think that we're missing one of our great cultural strengths on the education side. You know, we've all looked at the unraveling of the uh, economies of Eastern Europe and marveled at how screwed up they were because all these businesses were run by uh, governmental bureaucracies. And here we sit in our country, um, and we still have one of the most important aspects of our life, namely the education of our children, run by governmental bureaucracies. Uh, I think we ought to figure out a way to uh, allow the private enterprise system to uh, run the educational institutions. You can't fix deficiencies in the moral fabric by money. Who's clapping? <laughs> uh, other comments? Well, I, I think the, I favor, as you know, and I, I didn't say this before, I, or if I did, I don't remember, I, I favor more competition and a dramatic restructuring of the American education system. I think it is too much of a top-down bureaucracy. I think there should be more choice in the system. I think if you're going to run a public system, you have to have some protection for 
discrimination based on race, which you can legislate, and income, which you can't. You have to take affirmative action to make sure poor people know what their choices are and can exercise them. Um, so I think there need to be some dramatic structural changes in the system. Uh, I would say that, that it is somewhat more expensive for us, uh, particularly in K through 12 education, because we have a, a much more diverse student body, including a much larger underclass of people who will be a significant percentage of our workforce in the future. And the one thing I, I must tell you, Bob, the one place where I sort of, I have a jangle about your analysis is, I think it is self-evident that your neighbor, I don't care whether his components are engineered in Bulgaria or Timbuktu, it seems to me that if we share the same piece of land <clears throat> and you want to drive down streets and live in communities that are safe and wholesome and growing and have public institutions at work and parks you enjoy being in on the weekends and a place you're proud to be a part of, that there is a sense in which we are still a community and in which we do share common interests. And it seems to me the logic of your whole book is that the only community that's left is just the people you live with. Money's mobile, management's mobile. Everything in the wide world can be moved except it's the people that happen to be living in the same space of ground you are. So it seems to me that the argument has to be that. And I agree with you, I'm not prepared to say we need huge national tax increases for education. I do think that you should have these targeted opportunity programs. And I would point out, when people tell you we spend a higher percentage of GNP on education than other countries, they are. It is true that our system is too bureaucratic and that there are administrative cost savings which should be affected. But don't confuse the two figures because there are several countries which spend a higher percentage of GNP on kindergarten through 12th grade. And we spend a higher percentage because we have such a higher percentage of our people going on to college. Uh, it's uh, two and a half times the German figure, for example. Yeah, and Three it, times the Japanese figure because we have no system, but we have no system for all the others, so they get the shaft. And that's one reason the college dropout, by the way, college dropout rate in America is two and a half times the high school dropout rate. But to go back to your point, I believe that people will respond to a call to community. I think most people love this country. I think they want to be a part of it, and I think it really bothers them that middle class people have higher tax burdens and are getting less for it. And I'm, that may be just Pollyanna, but I think a lot of people are really concerned by that. Keith. I'm Keith Godfrey. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, and I guess my question, Governor Clinton, you're probably getting your share of questions tonight. It has to do with the real co political and perhaps even social consequences to this ever-broadening gulf between the 20% and the bottom 80%. And that is, we know from American history that whenever you have this gap between income groups in the 1930s, you had the tumultuous period with the labor movement starting. In the 1960s, you had the black community feeling disenfranchised, and uh, <coughs> that resulted in urban uh, riots and so forth. Uh, I don't sense the urgency that I really felt when I read your book, Bob, that something really heavy is going to happen if we don't really address these questions, not just in economic terms, recognizing that uh, the corporations and so forth, uh, well, we have to educate the uh, workforce, but also sort of a prophylaxis with regard to the political and social consequences of this gap that has taken place. What prescription do either of you have with regard to what possible political consequences there might be to this change in the economic environment? Well, I think there are two obvious ones, quite apart from whatever social disruption that you alluded to. And the two, to take the, the two that will shatter the paradigm within which you were raised, number one, if these trends continue for another generation, 30 years from now, when the next desert storm comes along, the U.S. will not be leading it. So we will no longer lead the world. We have done so much to make. Number two, the central animating idea of America, the, the American dream, will die because we will raise a whole generation of people who will take it for granted that they will not do as well as their parents. When that happens, you don't have, the, when those two things happen, you don't have the United States of America anymore. We don't have to dominate the world, but we have to be able to play a leading role. And we certainly have to be able to hold out hope to all these people, particularly those that are starting with so much less in life. 
I mean, I, I don't think the consequences could be much graver than they are. And I'm basically an innate optimist. I think we'll figure out we've got to do this and we'll do it. Democracies basically roll along until they just get the living daylights knocked out of them before they change dramatically. That's just in the nature of things. But I think it is, I can't tell you how strongly I feel. Just, you just imagine, if you believe what we're saying, imagine you, you do your technical, what, what you said about, your, yeah, but the other thing, planning the technological roadmap, do your, uh, do the sociological roadmap. Just play these trends out 10, 20, 30 years in your mind. And a lot of you who are younger than I am, 10 or 15 years younger than I am, imagine having your children grow up in that kind of a country. And that answers the question of where our common interest is. I think what really worries me is best summed up in the old parable of the frog in the saucepan. Do you know that parable? Yes? <laughs> no. No, you don't know the parable it's of the like frog in the saucepan. No, well, this parable is, you know, if you, if, it's a disgusting parable, actually. You put, you, if, you, if you put a frog in a lukewarm pan of water and you turn up the heat, uh, well, the frog may never get out. Uh, on the other hand, if you toss a frog into a boiling pan of water, the frog immediately jumps out. The difference is that in the first instance, the frog was not at any particular point in time shocked into an awareness of how uncomfortable it was. And I warned you that was a disgusting parable. <laughs> but the point is, and the, the serious point is that I, I worry sometimes that we go along incrementally Mm. like the frog mm. in the saucepan. Incrementally, things get worse, but we don't see it. We don't see it because we don't have anybody pointing it out. A lot of leaders are afraid to be doom and gloomy after the Carter Malay's speech. A lot of people are afraid to really talk about reality as it is, and they don't see it. It happens very gradually. Gradually, then suddenly we wake up, and it's very difficult to do anything about it. Uh, let me just make one other point on that. A lot of this is language, too. A lot of it is continuing to argue the problems in the same old terms so that a lot of people who would be angry enough to take action and would be willing as citizens to take action don't know how to make a claim on the political system for change. Mm -hmm. I mean, when a majority, let me just, as a southerner, let me give you one example. When a majority of white males voted for David Duke in Louisiana for the Senate, it wasn't so much that there was a dramatic upsurge of racism. It was that these people were responding, that he gave them something to vote against, and nobody had given them anything to vote for. And their economic fortunes declined more in the 80s than any other group of white males in the United States because of the collapse of the Louisiana economy. So nobody was saying, hey, here's how you can win too. And here's how white people and black people can win and how we can go forward together and how you can preserve your dreams. So these people, you're dealing with people that came home every night for years and looked at their families and thought they'd never be able to send their kids to college, never even go on a vacation again. They were working more and they were failures. And the anger that welled up inside them, the sense of, of absolute emasculation that overcame them was enormous collectively. This is happening to millions of people in America today. And they, but they don't, if there is no, if we keep carrying these debates out, just like we have, then these people are helpless. They could lay claim on a system. Those people that voted for David Duke might vote with you for a new America if they knew how to do it. And that's why a little forums like this are so important and these questions are important because we cannot keep the, we gotta change the terms of this debate or we're sunk. We, don't, we can't get the first place. Our, our, the health uh, insurance issue. Uh, I, I met a lot of people who didn't have health insurance in my campaign in 1990. I talked to a, lot, to a lot of people about it. I met a woman who was a widow with four kids working as a waitress in a little country restaurant, and she told me she knew she could go on welfare and draw Medicaid for her kids, but she thought it was immoral to do that if she could work. But still, every day, her guts were in knots waiting for one of her kids to get sick. But she doesn't know how to make a claim on the system, you see? And so the first thing you have to do is deal with the fact the frog's lukewarm. It's not boiling. It is a lukewarm frog. And the way to keep it alive way, is to change the terms of the debate. If you want to use that parable in your stump speech, please go ahead and <laughs> be, my, be my guest. <laughs> we have a, a couple, time for a couple more questions. Yes. OK, um, my name is Mary Offerdahl. I'm an alum from the school. And I wouldn't have been able to come here if it weren't for uh, my student loans. However, I graduated with an entry-level position in government, sort of a symbolic analyst-type job, 
And I find them pretty easy to pay off, actually. And I ask myself, did the interest rate really need to be subsidized on them? I don't think so in my case, although I know I couldn't have come here if it weren't for access to those loans. My question is this. Don't you think that money spent on subsidies, scholarships, or on um, subsidizing student loans wouldn't be better spent in expanding opportunity for graduate and college level education in widening access to the student loans? <clears throat> yes, I think we should spend it widening access to it, and then I think your repayment schedule, I, I would favor a whole different system where your repayment schedule would be tied in some measure on your ability to repay. Uh, Bob and I, when we went to Yale, they instituted a tuition the postponement option where all of us who were in a given class committed, who borrowed the money, and I did, committed to pay a certain percentage of our income for however many years it took for the class to pay off its debt. And I think that uh, I agree with you. If you can pay it off at a higher interest rate, you ought to, and we ought to take that money and give it, give the opportunity to more people. But the point is, the money should be available to you in the first place. Yeah. We, and what I, where I disagree with, disagree with President Reagan and disagree with President Bush is he's fixing to propose increasing the amount for which you're eligible, but lowering the income threshold, which I think is a terrible mistake. Especially given that college and university costs have increased 26 percent in real terms, inflation-adjusted terms over the last 10 years, average American family is barely holding on. Uh, let's, we have time for two more questions. Yes. Um, I was wondering, uh, I thought it might be a good idea if I had more um, vocational high schools. Like, I know when I went to high school, after two years, like my freshman and sophomore year, then I had to decide whether I'd take a commercial course or a college course. I thought, why, why aren't we zeroing in on the high schools in uh, having more, uh, more vocational high schools in Voc every town? Vocational high schools, uh, Hans, how does that fit in with apprenticeship? Do you have- I mean, Apprenticeship, I maybe that- that's Yeah, I mean, what, 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 what we do, we will work in tandem with vocational schools. And as a matter of fact, I think I didn't mention that before, the standards have to be set by both, by industry, in our case maybe Siemens, and the schools. But when so I that went to school, that was always looked down, to, down upon. That was the bottom of the ladder. That's lab. right, and that should, has so to be why, changed. So why, why can't we change that image? That, that is indeed that, what we that's want what to, you should That's indeed on. what we want to change, and we are, as I mentioned, uh, just in the process of selecting a site or two, and the, one of the obstacles could indeed be to, 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 to agree on certain standards that are not the lowest common denominator. In other words, are high enough to, to really be, be a model for that. Yeah, so we are in the process of doing that, at least for, aims, I mean, the, yeah. little, the little thing we do for ourselves. Thank you. Could, I'm not an expert on this, but in the Hartford area, a great deal of manufacturing is done by United Technologies Divisions, and we have adopted several schools, which in part means sending people who are newly retired who volunteer for this, and they go into the schools as supplementary teachers. It, it, we're, it's experimental, but it seems to be working out. It gives them something to do, and it also gives the kids something to hope for, as well as the substantive skills engaged. So that's a, also a promising that, idea. Yeah. And um, because none of Dr. Decker says you do None of you have talked about uh, such a simple thing as high school. The, the end, let me just say, the, the answer to your question, we have several area vocational high schools in our state where students who want to take more advanced vocational courses can, can go. But the answer to your question is <clears throat> that we are seeing, a, we are blurring the line between what is practical and what is academic. And that's a good thing. Some people learn academic skills in a practical setting even better than they do in a classroom setting. The vocational movement in America is developing something now called applied academics in recognition of the fact that vocational skills in most states need to be far higher than they are, far, far higher level than they are now. Mm -hmm. As that is done, and I think those applied academic programs will be put into the curricula of almost all states within the next five years, I think you'll see a big rise in the status and in the enrollment of vocational high school programs. I think that's the point. The, the status has to go out. In other words, it has to be felt to be a new option for those young that's people. That's what I mean. It has but to it's be not easy. just the status. In lieu of just going to college, yeah. they, they take that tack. That's really the it idea. It has to be. The image has to, that's has right. to be that's right. made a better image. Yeah. Okay, last, last question. Uh, my name is David Chung. I'm an undergraduate at Harvard. And this question is addressed mainly toward uh, former Chairman De Castro, but uh, all uh, five, uh, six distinguished members may also make a comment. 
you pointed out many differences between Japan and America, cultural differences and uh, institutional ones. Um, but we also all recognize the differences. And uh, for example, just the sort of racial, uh, ethnic homogeneity in Japan as opposed to our heterogeneity causing some problems or some, uh, or l having less problems or more problems. And if we as Americans are, are concerned about group collectivism and uh, sort of thinking not as individuals, uh, who's going to inspire that sort of thinking and action? Is it, is it the role of, of government or is it of business? Uh, I'd like to hear both sides. I, I'm not a strong believer that, that you can, in fact, change a country's culture in any dramatic way, certainly not anytime soon. Uh, m my point on, on the culture was, first, we ought to recognize where our cultural advantages and disadvantages lie. Uh, and there are certainly many. Uh, if go look at the awards of Nobel Prizes, for instance. You know, the U.S. just far outstrips Japan, and I think that also is a result of the fact that uh, a young uh, grad student can kind of go pick uh, the senior professor he wants to work for. If he doesn't like him, he'll go somewhere else, where in Japan he's not that mobile. Um, but I think we ought to look at where our cultural advantage is and try to make sure we take advantage of that. We ought to recognize where our disadvantages are. And in those cases where we can make some adjustment, great. Uh, the institutional side, though, I think is something that's totally within our hands and something that, that we really can get on with. I want to add something to this uh, on the specific point about uh, homogeneity in Japan. I think it's as much a liability as a strength. The Japanese clearly think it's a strength. And they clearly think that, you know, we are falling apart because we're so diverse. But you will notice in Japan a very lively debate now about creativity in the schools, for example, about ability to adjust to other cultures when Japanese companies begin to locate abroad and so on. It turns out that there, there are drawbacks in this, um, this uh, supposed homogeneity. Why do I say supposed? Because, in fact, strictly speaking, racially, the Japanese came from Korea, they came from Southeast Asia, there's a lot of difference. What they mean really is Japaneseness. And that uh, implies the emphasis on, on uh, the group and so forth and so on. Um, I don't want to say that uh, there aren't advantages to it. It's a society that uh, where people watch each other, and while that sounds offensive, I can walk, take the subway in Tokyo at 11 o'clock at night and feel safe. So I, th I think there's, I sense maybe here there's some move back towards the rediscovery of the American community, which, which is, after all, a part of the biblical tradition, the Puritan tradition, the ancient Greek tradition, all of the major traditions of American thought presuppose that the good of the individual depends in part on the, on the welfare of the group. And I, I, think, I just think and hope that we're going to move a bit back towards our extreme of, of meism, even as the Japanese, for their part, try to develop a little bit more. I just wanted to pick up on that point. I don't know either how one can change cultures, maybe one cannot, but first of all, we all do know that when we talk of competition, we usually put it in economic terms. We measure it and all of that, which is fine, <coughs> but deep down we know it has to do with those cultural underpinnings and, uh, and, and, and they are most important. And, but what you said, I think, is just right. We obviously are discussing something that is a phenomenon of the last, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years or so, obviously it was different before. And the question then is, why was it different before? Why is it different now? And can we go back to that? So maybe rather than jumping to ingredients of another culture, which is difficult altogether, maybe <coughs> we have to think of how can we go back to what it was before? Mm -hmm. So maybe that's something we should consider. We, Bill, did you? I just wanted to make one specific point to, to try to illustrate. I think you ask a very good question. But I think, once again, it's a false choice to say we have to choose individualism and pluralism or more teamwork and community. Um, I was very moved by that uh, Robert Bella's book that came out a couple of years ago, Habits of the Heart, which showed yeah. basically how people in very different income and social groups were yeah. profoundly lonely right. to be part of something bigger and how nearly everybody likes to be part, at some point, in life of some larger endeavor. And let me give you one specific example. I'm embarrassed, I can't remember. There is a professor at Berkeley of German descent who studied the study habits of various ethnic groups of undergraduates. And he found that 
the Asian students did better but did not work harder than the black freshmen because the black freshmen were ashamed to admit what they didn't know to one another so they never worked together either as blacks or as blacks and whites or in any group. So he, after studying these habits, organized some teams so that people, and, and got people over their embarrassment about what they didn't know, and within a matter of months, there, there was no difference in the achievement levels. Mm, that's it. So the point I want to, I'm embarrassed, I can't remember the man's name, somebody here may know, but yeah, that's it. And, and say it again. Yeah, that's right. So I think, I, I, I would say, if, I, if you don't remember anything else we say tonight, Remember Bob's line, don't get caught up in false categories. We are not forced to choose between two mutually unacceptable alternatives. We can create a new reality. And that may be the most important thing we have to keep uppermost in our minds. And the question we, we end with is not only what that new reality is, but also if we are no longer a separate and unique economy because of the globalizing tendencies all around us, are we nevertheless still a separate and unique society whose members continue to have abiding obligations to one another? That's the question, that's the issue that's going to be with us, presumably for the decades and decades ahead. Well, I think we uh, turn the heat up on the frog tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all, thank you all for coming. I want to thank uh, our panelists. Ed, Ellen, Hans, and Governor Bill Clinton. Thank you.